Well, today we are going to follow the record given by Luke in chapter 19. And in this record, um, Luke has given us a very, very brief but a very important account of an encounter between Jesus and this person, Zacchaeus. And uh, so we are going to look at this event and uh, I believe there is very, there's a great deal God is saying to us through this event. Now, firstly, who is this person and uh, why is he um, so desperate to see Jesus? Now, Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem and he has to pass through Jericho. But in verse, sorry, in chapter 18, Luke told us, as they were coming nearer to Jericho, he was stopped by the roadside by a beggar who was blind. And uh, Jesus healed him. So as a result, you know, people were praising God and they were also talking among themselves. Look, you know, have you heard this? Have you seen this? And this beggar, and uh, now he's, he has been given his sight. So you could imagine a big crowd has been following Jesus on the way to Jericho. Now, this person who must have heard of this event, and uh, he wants to know more about Jesus. So what do we see in this person, and who is he? Now, firstly, we notice this person who make an effort to meet Jesus is a rich person. In verse 1 and verse 2, uh, what does he do? He has got a very important job, acting as a tax collector. Not only as an ordinary tax collector, he's a chief. He's a commissioner of the tax office. And you could imagine um, doing the job as a tax man, he would not be a very popular person. And uh, not only he was in a high position, he was rich, he was wealthy, and perhaps it came with the job. Now the job wasn't that well paid, and uh, it wasn't paid in a way we do in our current day system because a tax collector is not employed by the uh, Roman uh, authority. They were given this job because they promised to collect the X number of amount in, form, in the form of tax, which is going to be surrendered to the Roman authorities. So you can see that it's a very unpopular job. And uh, in, in, in his position, uh, there are others who may abuse their authority and exploit uh, the people over this taxation system. I think I mentioned before, uh, in those days, you have to pay a poll tax. That is, whether you are earning or not, you have to pay according to the number of people in your household. And uh, you have to pay for tax when you go on the bridge, when you enter a town, when you're carrying goods, you have to pay tax. So I think uh, in terms of the taxation, I think ours is a clearer and a more fair system than those days. So you can imagine that he was in an unpopular job and um, he, wa he would not be welcome in many social circles or religious events, or he would not be invited to many homes. And in verse 7, you could, you could tell that he was such a person, uh, unwelcomed by the people in those days, for the remark they made on him in verse 7, when they later saw that Jesus is going to be a guest of this rich tax collector, or chief tax collector, Zacchaeus, they said, look, why did Jesus choose to go to his house as a guest? Doesn't Jesus know who he is? Do you know that he's a bad character? Yes, he may be rich, 
Yes, he may have a big house to, to show hospitality to, <coughs> to Jesus and the followers and the disciples. Yeah, we can understand that. If you have a large party, you will need a place with uh, more space, perhaps with servants. So it makes the job easier. Makes sense. But out of all these rich people in Jericho, why this sinner? This, you know, this character. And um, so you could see that, you know, he could be a very lonely person. Have you ever been made as an outcast by your own people? Well, he would know. You ask him. Now, secondly, we noticed this guy, he wanted to find out more about Jesus. And uh, in verse 3, he wanted to see Jesus, and um, so he therefore decided to join the crowd. However, the large crowd that followed Jesus uh, would prevent him from gaining direct access to him. So, what could he do? And uh, he is short, right? And uh, I don't think the crowd would let him push his way through. And as I said, probably there would be a large crowd following Jesus from the entrance of Jericho to his, um, his intended destination. So he was decided, okay, I'm not going to miss this. Now in those days, they don't have the fortunate of a television or uh, you know the mass communication in those in, in our days. Uh, not so long ago, when we watch the funeral of the late Queen of England or Britain, uh, we could sit at home. And I think we have a better view at home than those people waiting outside on the road. Because once the car, the procession passed by, and that's it. But at home, you can have a close-up view, and uh, you can sit and have your comfort while you are watching. But Zacchaeus decided, well, look, I'm not going to miss out. So he went ahead, and he wants to see Jesus in person. So he climbed up a sycamore fixed tree, which is common in Palestine, to ensure that he has a clear view of Jesus when he comes passing. Now, not only that will give him an unblocked panoramic view of the whole procession, he was given a close-up view when Jesus stopped at his very spot. Now, to his surprise, Jesus did not stop because he missed the rest. Not because someone stopped and asked Jesus for help, as the blind man did on the way to Jericho. Jesus chose to stop for a reason. What? He stopped and looked up and looked at Zacchaeus, focused on him and said, look, I'm stopping for you. Zacchaeus, come down immediately. He didn't say, well, come down because it's dangerous. <laughs> come down, I know what you want. You want to see me? I'm not just going to stop and shake your hand. Yes, you can ask me questions, but I'm going to stay at your house. So you can have a one-to-one -one meeting with me. You can ask me any questions you like, even in private. Now, when you are standing in the public, sometimes, you know, you might like to ask, you might not like to ask some personal questions, right? And the conversation, the dialogue will be, you know, pretty cordial and, you know, superficial up to a point. But you are not going to ask any personal questions like faith, or issues or concerns, right? So Jesus said, look, come down. I am going to stay at your house today. Now this totally unexpected result of Zacchaeus' effort. He wasn't 
just rewarded with a fleeting view of Jesus as he passed by, he must be over the moon to be told by Jesus that he is going to stay. So he come down immediately and welcome Jesus gladly to his home. Now, because of that, the criticism on Jesus came to the people who stood by and they said, look, I don't think Jesus made a good decision. We do not know any more than that, other than, look, he shouldn't be going to the place of a sinner. Now, what else do we see? Now, next, we see Zacchaeus stop and make a statement. Now, notice when he stopped, he did not defend himself and said, look, guy, you think I'm a sinner? Are you better than me? You think that, you know, I get my money through foul means? Have you not cheated? He never made any defense on his, for himself. He just simply make a statement. He said, look, Lord, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have wronged anyone or cheated anyone of anything, I will pay back with interest four times the amount. Now, let's stop and pause there. What does he mean by that? And what do you think of what he said? Well, as I said, he's not proving himself that he's not a sinner. He didn't say that, look, I'm not worthy to host Jesus. I'm a sinner. Yes, I'm not good enough for him. However, this is what I'm going to do. A, I respected Jesus. I call him Lord. Not just someone who passed by. Not just out of curiosity. I'm going to have a relationship with him. I address him as Master, as a Lord. And secondly, I'm going to give half of my possession. Now, so far in his job, he has been collecting money. He has been, he has been demanding money from others. And maybe that's why he made himself very, very wealthy. So for all his life, he has been a ticker, a grabber, make demand on people. But now, he said, look, I'm going to give. I'm to give voluntarily, willingly. In the past, whether you're rich or poor, you have to pay poll tax. If you can't pay, I'm sorry, you have to get someone to lend you money. And if you have to pay interest to the person who lend you money, well, so be it. I must have your tax. I don't care whether you're rich or poor. But now he realized there are many people who struggle in lives. There are many people who could not afford it. So he said, look, I'm going to give them my money. In the past, he pushed himself to the highest position so that he can feed his personal desires. He could be just acting as a tax collector, but he moved himself higher and higher to the chief of the chief. Well, sometimes I think it is a reflection on us, isn't it, as well. The more we earn, the more we desire. And I think sometimes the, the line between what we need and what we desire is getting a bit blur. And sometimes we might even use our desire or our need as a cover-up for our greed. There's a big difference, isn't it? What we need becomes a front to feed our greed. And uh, this is what he said, look, I want to be a giver. I'm not going to grab to feed my greed. I'm going to feed the needy with what I have. Half of it. 
Just notice half of your bank account, half of your personal asset. It's a great deal of great deal of money. And secondly, not only he decided to do so, he, he said, "Look, I am going to pay back the people that I have wrongly obtained from them." Either by deception or by foul means or unlawful means, I'm going to pay them back four times. Now, this is a clear act of restitution. He's going to compensate those who has suffered financially because of his wrongdoing. Now, according to God's law given to the Israelites in the Old Testament, this whole chunk of it. When God gave the, the law through Moses to His people, God said to them, "Look, out of all these nations, I have revealed Myself to you. And when you were lost and uh, locked up and served as slaves in Egypt, I set you free. I brought you out. And of all these people, I've known you. So." I want to reveal myself to you that I am the only God. So serve me and worship me. Then I'll be your God and you'll be my people. So therefore, live as the way I show you, not as other nations. So there are laws which governs their moral behavior, laws that applies to their society how to run their. You know uh, um, the way they uh, interact among themselves, how to run their household between parents and children, etc., etc. But there is one clearly says in Leviticus that is, if you have falsely uh, swear, it means you have cheated uh, someone, then you have to pay back, right? Now, nowadays, I think it's very, very easily um, uh, sort of fall into this category, isn't it? When we say to people, "Look, this is a good product," because maybe you know we get a better commission out of that, even though it may not be a good product, but you know, as compared to others. Now, this is by deception, isn't it? Really, you're not telling the truth. You're pushing that product because you gain more out of that. So this is what it means by swore falsely about it. Honestly, honestly, but you know, honestly, that is not true. But you say honestly, this is a better product. So <clears throat> God said, if you have done so, out of foul means for your own benefit. Then, if you have cheated someone, if you've stolen from them, then you must pay back with interest. Not only to return the goods, but pay them twenty percent, <clears throat> one fifth of its value. Now, so Zacchaeus could have said, "Look, I'm going to pay back the, all the people I have cheated." And I pay back with the interest of, you know, twenty percent. No, he said, "Look, I'm going to pay back four times, four hundred percent." Now, so in this act, what do we see in the person of Zacchaeus? He's determined to live as a changed person after meeting Jesus, right? And.、Um, After hearing this, Jesus gave his remark and promise. Jesus said, "Look, today salvation has come to this house. Salvation has come to this house. Just notice." Jesus did not say, "Well, yeah, I'll be gladly、uh, going to your house as a guest," but he said, "Look." Not only me coming to your house, but salvation is going to come to your house. Well, on this, 
let's pause and ask, well, why did Jesus say salvation will come to this person's house? Is it because Zacchaeus has, well, out of all these people, has made the best promise before him? Was he the best person in Jericho? Well, hardly, because the people didn't think so. So, what makes this person stand out from the others? That salvation will go to his house. Have you thought about it? Now, firstly, let's just be clear. Salvation is not earned by any personal effort, not even in the person of Zacchaeus, by giving half of his possessions and repay anyone that he has cheated with four times the amount. Yes, he did it. It was right to do so. It was honourable. It was pleasing to God. But for all the amount that he's given, they will not be enough, as it were, to warrant God's salvation. Now, I'm not saying that when we come to God, we do not seek to put right our wrong, that we should not repent and stop you know, the wrongdoings. What I mean is, even when we stand before God and make all the promises with you know, the bottom of your heart, even if you tell God that, yes, I know I'm a very, very bad person. Yes, I'm determined. I want to make a new life. Does that mean that God sh should look at you and say, yeah, I heard your promise. Not only for now. Yes, I know that you mean it when you say you will walk a life of uh, 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 integrity for the rest of your life and you will follow me and listen to me but why should I be merciful to you? Can you see what I mean? But the salvation was given to him out of mercy out of God's mercy that's, that's it salvation comes to him not because he has made that promise. Before that, remember, when he was on the tree, Jesus said, look, come down. I'm coming to your house. That was before he made that promise to give away half of his possessions. Before he promised that he is going to turn a new leaf and live a new life. Jesus said, look, salvation comes to you because I am coming to your house. Secondly, so salvation is attached to the person of Jesus. So he gets more, he gets, Zacchaeus has got more than he, 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 he sets out to, to uh, uh, for. Perhaps initially he would be very, very, very happy to have a good view of Jesus. He was awarded a close up view. Maybe he was just hoping to maybe ask one or two questions, maybe to shake Jesus' hand. No, Jesus said, look, I'm going to stay in your house. I'm going to stay there to hear you, to listen to you. I'm going to stay and give you salvation. I think that's really, really touching to me. And um, in this incident, Jesus said, look, salvation has come to this house because, what? In verse 9, because this man too is a son of Abraham. Now, to, the, to, the, to many people in the eyes of the world, this is not worthy to be saved. It's a sinner. He has been, you know, helping the Roman authorities to suppress and to exploit his own people. He makes use, he, he makes use, he make use of his authority for his own purpose, to make himself rich. No, he doesn't deserve to be a Christian. He doesn't deserve to be saved. No, Jesus said, look, 
because he too is a son of Abraham. Now, what does, what does that mean? Because no matter how bad a person is, he's still a person worthy to be saved. Son of Abraham. For the Jews, implies that he is by raised by the linkage. They are descendants of Abraham. God gave Abraham a promise that I will bless you and your descendants. So, so by saying that, Jesus is saying, look, God is a God of covenant. God is a God of grace. Back in those days, God revealed himself to Abraham and said, look, follow me. Follow me. Leave your country. Leave your people. Leave your religion. Because I'm the only God who made heaven and earth. You worship me, then you will know that I am truly worthy to be worshipped. I'll bless you. I'll bless your descendants. So Jesus is saying, look, this guy may not be worthy to be saved in your eyes, but he's still a person to whom God is going to show favour because of his promise. He's a merciful God. And then secondly, in verse 10, he said, look, salvation only comes to one person in Jer Jericho? It's a bit unfair, isn't it? No. Physically, Jesus can be at one place at one time. But Jesus said, look, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. So verse 10 ap applies to all the people around in those times. Jesus is telling not only Zacchaeus, but the people who heard this statement, including those people who did not have the privilege to invite Jesus home. But Jesus said, look, I have come to seek you out, not to punish you. If we get a letter from the tax office, if we wonder, oh, if I get a letter from the authority, I'm wondering, now, what have I done? Or, uh, or the, you know, have I been caught speeding? Have I been sought out? If God comes to me, am I going to uh, get a pass mark? Jesus said, look, I'm coming to seek you out, to save you, to save what was lost. I know you can't help yourself. I know you cannot get out of it. And that's why I've come. If you can't find your way, then don't worry if you cry out. Like Zacchaeus, he has no chance to see Jesus out of the crowd. But he was determined. He didn't want to let Jesus pass him by. So Jesus is saying, look, if you come to seek Jesus in a way that Zacchaeus has determined, not because of his own promise that how much he has given or how much he's going to give, but Jesus said, because you're determined to make a change in your life towards God, and when you cry out, Jesus said, look, yes, even though you may not be a Jew, even though you have no relationship with anyone who is religious, I've come for you. Salvation will come to your house too. So that's what happened at that time. What happened now? Does this apply to us, we ask? Well, I think so. Firstly, God has made sure that this event is recorded for your and for my benefit and for anyone who choose to find, uh, find out about God. It's written in the Bible. And uh, the question is, are we lost? Sometimes I think we are a bit lost in our way, right? In our lives, we're so busy with 
different activities, and some of them are legitimate and valid activities. Like we need to care for our family. We need to, you know, be a good citizen. Last week we mentioned it. We want to be a good employer. We want to be a good husband and good wife. So therefore, sometimes we get sort of snowed under by all these demands and activities that God has been pushed to one side, and it's easily lost sight of God. But Zacchaeus makes sure he's going to climb up. So he can have a good view of Jesus. Not only that, I'm sure he's not just going to have a fleeting look of who Jesus is. He must have heard how Jesus has taught others, how Jesus has healed many, how he has come to Jerusalem to bring God's message. Has been teaching so many people. Five thousand people went to the wilderness just to hear him. Am I going to miss that out? But if we are lost, then good news is Jesus knows. Jesus said, "I've come to seek the lost." Jesus is passing by today. We may not hear him. Audibly, we may not see him physically, but we hear God's word being spoken and explained in many places. We can read God's word just by opening the Bible. We can read, and God wants you to know that's why it is written there. Jesus said, "Look, I've come." No. We didn't live two thousand years ago when he was here, but Jesus is still living, and his message is being told through the Bible and through us Christians, people who know him. So, if you hear God's word either through Christian testimony, or when you hear God's word being preached in Bible-believing churches, if you read about it, then. Take it seriously, because God wants you to know. Take the opportunity that you might be busy now, but make time for it, as Zacchaeus did. He put down his job temporarily, or at least you know he walked away from his desk, from the from the collection point where he gets his tax from. He went to see Jesus, and he makes sure that he. Sees Jesus, so you too can turn to God, turn to God's word, turn to God's people, and ask, "How do I know more about Jesus? Show me who He is. Show me what He says. I want to know more." Now, if you're willing to invite Jesus into your life, you don't need to stand and justify yourself. That you are worthy for God's attention. The people said, "Look, Zacchaeus, he's a sinner. He doesn't worth it. He doesn't warrant God's attention or Jesus' attention." But Jesus stopped for him. So, if you want to meet Jesus seriously, if you desire to have a changed life, and said, "Look, I want to." Focus on something more important now. I'm lost in my pursuit in my life. Yes, there are valid reasons, but there's something more than that. I'm sure Zacchaeus is what he, what was living a very uh, uh, comfortable life. He was very wealthy, and uh, yet he knew that there's something more in life. And、uh, this is what Jesus promised to anyone. He's coming, and he has come, and even today he is seeking and to save what is lost. Now, I just want to finish with an illustration. It is a real testimony of a person I know in Britain. She has passed away now, but I won't mention any names. Now, 
she was a simple housewife, and uh, and uh, she has no knowledge of the Bible. She didn't come from a Christian circle, and uh, to quote her words, she just loved playing mahjong all day, if she can, and uh, she she often does all in all her spare time. Husband works all day, so he leaves home early. He doesn't come home until very late at night. Got children to care for, but what, what would she do? After the children have gone to school, she gets around friends and play mahjong. But the children come home from school, you would expect, well, mom, I'm hungry. She would just give some small change and say, Kids, see to yourself, go and buy some noodles, buy some food, bread, whatever. See to yourself, and then she'll carry on playing mahjong. And that's her life. And she said herself, she said, I'm such a lousy mother, a terrible wife, irresponsible person. And, uh, but then she said, she realized not far from where she lives, there's a church, and there's a person who goes in and out, and uh, she's a, the person is a foreigner in Hong Kong. Okay, well, in those days especially, a foreigner comes in and out, you sort of get noticed. So she noticed, oh, well, this guy seems to go to the church. They have no conversation because of the language barrier. And uh, she didn't stop and ask, well, what are you doing there? Or tell me about your religion. She had no desire to know anything. So she just remembered, well, yeah, well, this guy seems a good guy and he goes to church. And that was it. But then one day, and she just said, somehow, she just had a terrible conviction and, and, her, and she thought, I'm such a lousy mother. Why can't I be a person like this guy, this foreigner who goes to church? And that was it. And that was it. So she decided, well, look, that's going to stop. I'm going to be a good person. I want to be a Christian. And then guess what she did? No, no, no. She didn't knock on the door. <laughs> she didn't ask the foreigner. She decided, that, look, I'm going to have a new life. But before that, I know that I love mahjong. So she said, look, I'm going to play mahjong for the last time in my life. So she called her friends and they played mahjong, I don't know, for many hours. She said, look, I'm going, she said to her friends, I'm going to play mahjong with you once more for the rest of my life. And from now, I'm not going to play and I'm going to be a changed person. And that's what she did. So after that, she went to church. And, and then, of course, she heard the gospel and she came to know Christ. And for the rest of her life, she lived a very good, dedicated Christian life. Now, so I think in this personal experience, what we could see that God is really merciful. She wasn't an educated person in her eyes. She's not worthy to be a Christian. But yet, when she grabbed that opportunity, she remembered, yes, there is a new, a better life. And uh, she doesn't need to remain and spend the rest of her life as a lousy mother just play mahjong and to satisfy her own pleasure in this way. She began a new life through Christ. So this is her story. Now we have different stories and we come to God through Christ in a different way. But the, but the end of it is, as this story reminds us, this record, I think this verse, is really powerful and I want to leave that with you. 
for the Son of Man, Jesus, came to seek and to save what was lost. Are you lost? Do you want to be found? Then come to Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you are such a loving, merciful God, that you, your love, your unwarranted love has extended to people far and wide, even now to us who are, the, who are not worthy to be saved. But Lord, we thank you that out of your grace, you sent your only Son, the Lord Jesus, who came to seek us out, even to die on the cross for our sin, so that through him our sin might be forgiven, that through him we might be able to be chosen and brought back into your household to receive the salvation that you have prepared for us. Lord, we give you thanks. And we pray that, Lord, you will help us to share this joy of salvation to the members of our household. Lord, our desire is to see the salvation not only to come to us as a person, but to the family, to the family members, relatives, friends, and people that we know in the neighbourhood or in the network. So, Lord, we thank you and we ask you to help us. In Jesus' name, Amen.